Welcome to Al Bernstein Unplugged Unboxing. In a 40-year Hall of Fame career, Al has chronicled some of the greatest moments in boxing history. On this podcast, you get to hear him expand on those memories and talk about the current news in the sport of boxing. You also hear Al interview some of the biggest names in the sport. Here's Al Bernstein Unplugged. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of this show, uh, one in which we are going to interview my colleague, and friend Mauro Ronaldo. And I think it's an interview that you will want to look at. It is actually one of the more compelling that I have done in a long time. And Mauro is a very intriguing man to be sure uh, and, uh, and entertaining as well. Uh, did I say intriguing and entertaining? Wait, I could be talking about my co-host, Trip Mitchell, who will join us right now. Uh, are you in fact, Trip, in, intriguing and entertaining? Al, if I had any question about how well you read the promos that I write for you, this is a case in point. You nailed it. Yeah. And and in the future, by the way, the payments you make to me should be in cash, not in check form. <laughs> well, darn it. it. You know, one time, Al, you, you, you're you still holding, reminding me of that. Gosh. Yeah, that one time the check didn't clear, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, we uh, we uh, have a, a very interesting time in the sport of boxing where where the, the matches are uh, – are coming at us now fast and furious. And this weekend, we got a good one too. We do. Uh, Top Rank is a step forward. They've got a a great setup. And isn't that ironic? Because Showtime has you flying all the way to Connecticut. If you're with Top Rank, you could walk out your back door. (laughs) That's right. I'm doing it. Top Rank and ESPN are here and Showtime is back in uh, Connecticut in the Mohegan Sun. So uh, yeah, I could I could just uh, take the Uber over to the to their <laughs> fights. And they have a good one coming up uh, with um, this weekend on Saturday, uh, the 29th, with uh, Victor Postal challenging Jose Ramirez for the 140 pound titles, two of those titles that Jose Ramirez has. And Ramirez, who has not fought in a year, one of the most exciting fighters in boxing, uh, a fighter who hopes to uh, win this fight and then unify, further unify the titles with Josh Taylor, who is a terrific fighter, and then move up to 147 pounds. I think this bout is a really an interesting one because uh, we know Ramirez, we know how exciting he is, but Victor Postal, at his best, is a really tough nut to crack. I went to Glasgow, um, Scotland, uh, to do for uh, Channel 5 over in uh, – uh, in uh, the UK to broadcast the fight in which Josh Taylor fought Victor Postal there. It was a terrific fight. Uh, Taylor got a kind of a lopsided decision, but even uh, uh, Taylor and his people afterwards said, no, it was a much closer fight than the judges had it. And Postal fought very well in that match. So I think he brings a lot into this fight uh, against Jose Ramirez. He's a tall, lanky boxer. Ramirez is a fighter that likes to come in and be very aggressive. So from a stylistic standpoint, it's really excellent. And I am looking forward to seeing how it plays out. And then all boxing fans are hoping that whoever wins this match could fight Josh Taylor uh, and unify the titles. And, and oh, by the way, while Ramirez is the favorite, if Victor Postal won this fight, he would make an entertaining rematch with uh, Josh Taylor. So we'll see how this all plays out, but it's a, so it'll, it'll make for a very interesting fight this weekend. And you're going to be out in Connecticut looking forward to another weekend. And then later on at the end of September, you've got a double header. You're going to be a busy man. Yeah, September 19th, we have a, a matchup with Erickson Lubin and Terrell uh, Gachet. Um, and uh, that's going to be a good card. And then the 26th, as you pointed out, uh, we're going to have the, um, uh, the big pay-per-view uh, double header in which it'll be a, a, a day night kind of uh, affair, in which we'll have three fights that start at 7 p.m. Eastern or 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, featuring uh, Jamal Charlo against uh, Sergey Dervinchenko, uh, with two other fights with that, two other really good fights. And then in the evening portion, after a half hour break, we're going to have uh, Jamal Charlo, his uh, brother taking on Jason Rosario in uh, a title matchup and then a couple of great matches with that as well. And so uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that. 
Okay. And again, we take your questions, uh, Al, with well over 65,000 Twitter followers. We've gotten some great questions. First question, what was the saddest moment after a fight you've ever had with a boxer? Yeah, you know, I've had several where I've been around boxers and, and, and you could feel their anguish from a loss. And one of them was after Evander Holyfield fought Riddick Bow. I did the pay-per-view in their first fight. Uh, in which Evander Holyfield lost. Uh, it was a stirring contest. And when we couldn't interview Holyfield in the ring, and I was, before the show ended, I was dispatched to his dressing room where they let me in. And it, the scene was, you know, uh, amazingly somber, of course. And he was sitting on the floor, on the ground, with his back up against the, the wall. Uh, why he was there, I don't know, but for some reason, that's just where he ended up. And he was just, you know, mulling over the terrible event that had just happened. And I had to literally get down on my knees to sit next to him to do this interview. And we did. And it was really one of the more remarkable moments I've had in television. Uh, he was, I thought, extremely gracious to even do the interview at that juncture. Uh, and the way he did it and the way he talked about um, how he did his best and it just wasn't enough uh, was, you know, not surprising given Evander Holyfield, uh, but nonetheless, it was pretty amazing. So that was a, a very somber moment with a fighter after a very difficult loss. Yeah, and the empathy as an announcer you've got to have there has got to be either either have it or you don't. Very genuine moment. That's a very good point, Trip. You either have it or you don't. If you don't, and if you are not capable of that, uh, it'll come through. Uh, and, and I think you need to be. Uh, it's not that you're playing favorites or you're uh, in any way. You just need to have that for that person who is, you're, you know, you're, you're um, chronicling something that's happening in real time that's very real to that person. And you need to make sure that what you're doing uh, fits the moment. Um, great job there. What prospect in boxing is, excites you now? One of the people that I, I'm very excited to see how they do is called is Jerron Ennis, Boots Ennis, who's going to be on the uh, one of the Showtime cards coming up that I'm going to be broadcasting. He's a welterweight. He's undefeated. He has not yet, yet faced top competition. Uh, he wants to, and he wants to step up in competition. Uh, it's been difficult for them to get the right opponents, to get opponents uh, at a certain level to fight him. Uh, he is wildly exciting. He reels off great combinations. He has power. The only question about him clearly is we just don't know when he's in against an A-level or B-level fighter, how is he going to respond? Uh, but he might have a few defensive liabilities because he's so offensive-minded in the way he approaches the sport. but you know, it's often been said the best defense is a good offense. And boy, has he got a good offense. And uh, so uh, that's the name for boxing fans to remember. Uh, Jerron Ennis, it's called Boots, Boots Ennis. He's really something. Okay. And the final question is not a very polite question, but it got sent to us. So I got to do it. But how many broadcast partners have you had? Let's just put it this way. The number is uh, higher than the amount of lovers that Madonna has had. Holy. <laughs> How about Will Chamberlain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, Will, Will still has me beat. Um, yeah, I, you know, when I wrote my book back in 2012, I wrote down in the book everybody that had been, I put a, a block in the book about everybody that to that point had been my partner. And I think it was, hovering around 70 or 80, I'm going to say, and by the way, you are in the list of partners I've worked with at Ringside. Uh, and since that time, I'm going to say I've probably added another 20 or 25. So, you know, I'm, I'm hovering in the 100 range for sure. And uh, there was a time on the ESPN Top Rank Boxing Series where I worked eight weeks, that's two months of a, you know, for the most part of, of a weekly boxing series in which I had Hagler Leonard, seven different partners. <laughs> <laughs> Only once was the partner repeated. So uh, I've become pretty good at adapting to working with, uh, with different people. And, you know, the interesting part about that is that you, 
everyone does have a different approach and everyone does have a different cadence and they have a, you know, they're, nobody's exactly the same. So trying to do that is often an intriguing, uh, intriguing endeavor. Now, that question is a perfect one for this show because one of the people who uh, uh, is in the list of partners that I have worked with, uh, and he's been, a, now he's celebrating, by the way, his eighth anniversary of uh, doing the uh, boxing at, uh, at Showtime. Uh, and he is uh, a very talented and intriguing man, my good friend, Mauro Ronaldo. And we had a chance to visit with Mauro and uh, this is already going to be one of my favorite interviews so far uh, of this series. Here's my talk with Mauro Ronaldo. Mauro, you have done something that no one else has ever done. You've done liter you have been the play-by-play -play announcer for literally every combat sport there is: boxing, MMA, um, professional wrestling, kickboxing, uh, and I'm guessing Muay Thai comes under the kickboxing yeah. banner. Did and so here you were, a young boy in British Columbia, probably dreaming of uh, an announcing career. I know you were. Uh, pretty amazing that you could make that statement, huh? Uh, Al, yeah, definitely. And, and let's not forget the longest fight I've called, the one between my mom and dad, which is going on <laughs> 52 plus years now, Al. <laughs> but, you know, I have to do credit. I have to give credit to my parents. Uh, my father, uh, co immigrants coming from Italy, didn't understand the language in the 60s. Uh, obviously, by all means, not a lot of money, trying to make a new life for themselves. And they came across on the three channels back in the day, uh, professional wrestling. So my father uh, used to go down to the shows and as a young family, uh, affordable entertainment, they took us to the shows. And I instantly fell in love with all of it, Al, in terms of not only the athleticism that was apparent, the theatrical aspect, it really uh, spoke to me as something that I, I wanted to be a part of at a young age. So I, I listened to, you know, radio announcers. I, I was always intrigued by the voices I would hear on the news or, or doing sports. And so I, I hate to use the term visualize because it makes it maybe sound a little hokey or new age. Mm -hmm. But at five years old, Al, I truly did feel an energy come through my body. Yeah and made me go, this is what I want to do. Started excelling in English, started reading out loud, uh, started studying like announcers. And at 16, my childhood dream was realized. And here we are 34 years later, almost catching up to you, Mr. Bernstein. <laughs> you, uh, you've been at this for a long time. And as I said, you've created some history too. Yeah, I think when, for a lot of us, we know early what we want to do. And this calling often comes very early. Now you joined, uh, me and the, uh, on the boxing literally just about eight years ago. Yeah. And um, it, so it's been an interesting boxing journey for you for a couple of reasons. One, uh, that was the beginning of you announcing boxing. You had never done it. We, you and I sat down to do the first boxing show that you ever did uh, uh, as kind of an audition to, for you to do it. And you have either a curse or a blessing. I'm not sure which it is that literally about 99% of the boxing that you have done, you've had to suffer me sitting next to you. It so that, is, that, no one should face that kind of curse. My friend, <laughs> uh, it is the one of the great blessings and highlights of my life. And, and I get a little goosebumps and emotional when I remembered being asked by Gordon Hall and David Dinkins, hey, do you mind, I mean, we'd like to audition you. Uh, you're gonna work with Al Bernstein. I'm like, what? And to know what you did for me, Al, let's face it, you, you gave up your time. You had to fly across the country to be there. And not only were you and instantly made me feel comfortable, but I truly believe you helped me succeed because, and you asked about the, you know, all the sports that I've done. Boxing is the one that's been steeped in so much history and you've been such yeah. a big part of it that I was instantly made to feel comfortable. And I can't stress enough what people like you, Steve Farhood, uh, the, uh, David, you know, the name go on and on. I, I've told you this millions of times, it's a family. And for you to, to go out of your way to help me, you're the reason I'm here eight years later still doing boxing. So thank you, sir. Well, I remember the night we sat down for the first show and I remember instantly feeling, and I, I, this is really true, that your tempo, of course you had done, you know, 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of, of shows in combat sports and kickboxing and uh, MMA. So you were hardly a newcomer to combat sports, but boxing was different. It's a little mm -hmm. different than the animal. But I immediately felt that your intu intuitive ability to, to figure it out. So it was, it was pretty amazing. Now, having said that, how different is boxing from, let's say, mixed martial arts? Uh, now, you, you, you are also capable of being an analyst on mixed martial arts. So you're, you, you know, for the, which even is a burden sometimes if you have to do play-by-play -play on mixed martial arts. Right. It is for me sometimes when I'm doing boxing play-by-play -play because I already know the other role and you have to be careful not to lapse into it. Amen. But in boxing, what's the differences between MMA and boxing in terms of play-by-play? Sure. Um, I mean, obviously, MMA incorporates a lot more disciplines. Yeah. Uh, the fact that you have to know a little bit about wrestling, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. kickboxing, boxing. It really is mixed martial arts. And so for me, that would seem a little daunting at first because, again, I come from a, uh, you know, I've called all the, the ball and, uh, you know, the stick sports as they yeah. were back in the day. But boxing and MMA, for boxing, there is a change in my tempo as much as people still feel maybe I'm a little over the top at times, maybe a lot over the top. It is me authentically. It is me, uh, what my energy is, as you know, Al. So for me, boxing has helped me mature as an announcer. And, and honestly, having people like yourself and, and all these other hall of famers to work with, I'm, I'm receiving not so much even knowledge, but the energy. So for me, oh, okay. the biggest difference is letting it, Boxing has a story to tell. MMA explosive can end at yeah, any time. Yeah, boxing similar. So it's more, MMA may be a little more creative and having to be involved in different ways. Boxing, I can tell the story in my, in yeah. my fashion and, and, and within a pattern and, and allow it to unfold. Yeah, it's very, it's a really good point. And you do that and still incorporate it into the, the action, which is, a harder thing to do now you and i have together uh done the entire third or final portion of the mayweather oh yeah uh career or what we think is the final part of it. <laughs> uh, and in that you know it, it, you know there were all these pay-per-views and all these uh, fights that were major pay-per-views the mcgregor fight the uh, Gosh, yeah. uh the canelo fight the pacquiao fight of course the one common thread through those big pay-per-views was Mayweather. And how did, how do you, when you look back at that period where we did all those Mayweather fights and the other ones, uh, what, what's your general takeaway from that? Well, uh, I, I call myself the forced gump of broadcasting out to a degree. I'm always at the right place at the right time when big events happen. September yeah. of 2012, I was hired to do Showtime Boxing. You may recall months later, Floyd Mayweather jumped ship to Showtime, yeah. uh, Robert Guerrero. So I was, I came in as Floyd Mayweather <laughs> came to Showtime. A little, and I was a, little, a little secret. They came because you came. <laughs> that was the reason. I, I was on the phone. I have my hey, sources. Leonard, Leonard Ellerby, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm taking over boxing. It's about time Floyd comes over. You've always <laughs> wanted me to call us fights, right? Uh, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry I, I interrupted. Yeah, he... Everything else aside, and I know that's hard to do, especially nowadays, the internet's got everything. Looking strictly as Floyd Mayweather, the boxer and the athlete, it was simply incredible uh, to watch what he was able to do, Al. We, I mean, when I look back at my career, uh, I've called the biggest names in sports, combat sports, but he has to be right near yeah. the, at the top. Uh, the best boxer of his generation, the fact that what I like most about Floyd Mayweather and, and, and what he meant to the sport, Al, you, four years old, he's in the gym becoming a prodigy. Right. This is all he's done, and people can criticize the, anything about all of this, sure. but, but to be a part of not only the biggest fights, but spectacles. Mayweather McGregor was my world colliding in ways I could never fathom. Yeah, yeah. I would have never guessed that fight would happen. So Mayweather made it larger than life. Mayweather's events were happenings and, and to be that close and to, to see genius at work, uh, it's, it's, it's humbling. <laughs> yeah, and he was, uh, he remains an enigmatic figure. You may have, you know, for all the interviews we did with Floyd Mayweather and all the fights we called and all the rest, 
I don't think, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, and I've known him for many, many years. I did his first- You called his play. debut, did you not? Yeah, I did, did his, his pro debut. debut. Right afterwards. I'm not sure not you or I could pinpoint what we think is the true personality or what's going on with Floyd Mayweather at any given time. He is a very circumspect in many ways. Absolutely. Uh, and and ob I don't want to say it's a persona, but it's a persona, I believe. He yeah. knows. He, he's a brand. He's a billion yeah. dollar brand. I believe yeah. he has everything. And, and I mean, like you say, we've interviewed him out. We've asked questions. You get the same sound bites if he's yeah. in that mood that day. So you're right. Uh, enigmatic and and in many ways uh yeah you know maybe he was he's a heel in a world that you know needs the the the, yeah. the heels and the bad guys and he really i mean began with the oscar de la hoya fight right sure. wearing the sombrero yeah. backwards the money mayweather persona right. so he represents uh maybe the best and worst of boxing and boxing is filled with the best and worst right yeah that's no, it's interesting and he's very good at uh, it's like a political uh you know, a great politician is good at delivering his message from Floyd as always. And he's good at making money. And Mara, one of the great drinking games, I'm sure, <laughs> in America is when people are watching the Showtime Championship Boxing Show and they're wondering when the first one will come, what the nature of it will be, and what topic areas you're going to hit with your pop culture references. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they are waiting on pins and needles for those. Yeah. And of course, so am I, because I don't know what they're going to be on the broadcast. And it presents a challenge to me because you can go off in many different directions <laughs> and it's your signature and it's your way of kind of, I'm going to guess, and you're mm. going to be the one that answers this, mm. your way of kind of bringing the world into our little wow. cubicle that we're now involved in. Is that a fair statement? Thank you, Al. Maybe the first person to ever truly say that. And honestly, I'm, uh, for me, Al, it's uh, maybe a carryover from my radio DJ days or whatever. I've always had a curious mind. I love inane, banal, useless <laughs> trivia, if it may be. Uh, but I hope I always thread it through the story of the fight. I'm using it to describe something we are witnessing. Or, yeah, maybe a little aside that's happening in the pop culture sphere that could make the, the, the girlfriend or the boyfriend on the couch who's not into the fight go, oh, wait a minute, okay, I get that, or I... And, and honestly, Al, for me, and I, I know people say, uh, you know, it's not everyone's cup of tea, granted. I use it to try to avoid saying the same old, I won't swear, but same old yeah, crap, yeah, Al. Okay. There's a lot of cliches <laughs> in our lives. Yeah. And for me, it's being creative with even cliches or, or trying to describe things by painting word pictures and you as much as anybody do the same thing you're an entertainer and i gotta say this again the, the mutual love fest here um you are the first broadcaster maybe one of the only ones john mccarthy of bellator now but you're one of the few broadcasters recently that i've worked with that at least supports me doesn't let me hang out to dry or let me uh bomb as it were even if it's not always shakespeare <laughs> but al you you even on the saturday you're you're responding when i said um romero he grunts with every punch rather loudly I, al is, what is he a tennis player and you're like ah you know and then you come up with something to me it builds camaraderie for us it shows yeah. that we do listen and are connected and and obviously i don't want it to be a crutch i don't want it to be my only uh, attribute as a broadcaster, but it is something I take pride in. And sometimes people say, does it come off the top of your head? Yes. And other times, obviously when preparing, holy smokes, this writes itself or this should work or, or what's, what's happening in music that, that maybe fits. Mama said, knock you out. Isn't that a, bo a boxing reference from back in the day? <laughs> well, so you're anyway, very careful. That's... You know what I love? You find uh, pop culture references that for the most part I'm hip to. And <laughs> now the and that's why you said you keep me on your toe on my toes because you know it's possible, for instance, just barely possible that I am not the expert on hip hop culture in America. <laughs> it's just possible. Now I'm not saying I'm not, but it's possible. I so I have to at least have the working knowledge now <laughs> around. Well, and things. you know what, hip hop has become our top forty now. And yeah, I, that's I, again, people right. can say, and again, in this day and age, and I've always said this, cultural appropriation, no. Cultural appreciation, yeah. amen. 
And I have always enjoyed hip hop. And not everyone knows I was a club DJ for years. And I would go to Seattle and and get the latest hip hop, try to introduce it. And and it's spoken word, it's rhythm. It's to me, I'm a hip hop aficionado because I enjoy the skills and the talent. But at the same time, Al, like yourself, I love music. I, I know you're you know you're a very musical family. I got my keyboard that I, I hammer on, but it's we are lyricists, Al. With there's a That's cadence true. and a musicality to what we do. So I hip hop is hip right now. A lot of our fighters, uh, Adrian Broner, the Char, like it's part of our culture. Javante Davis right. uh, in Atlanta came out with maybe the hottest rapper right, right. now in Atlanta, Little Baby. So. To me, it's it's not like trying to shoehorn or be the cool hip guy. No. I'm 50 years old. No. I get that, but no. I want to respect demographics. I want to respect the fighters, and and to me, it's it's a love. It's not a stunt. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good way to phrase it. Now you have uh, been an advocate for um, making the right strides in approaching mental illness because you yourself have suffered from a mental disorder. Uh, You're bipolar and a wonderful documentary was done about you uh, with your participation with Showtime called The Bipolar Rock and Roller, which is a great title. And uh, you have been a real advocate for helping people discuss mental illness in the right way. Um, and, and it's obviously a deep, deeply personal uh, topic to you. Uh, absolutely, Al. In fact, it is something I see becoming a bigger part of my professional life, perhaps. I'm, I've made, as you are, you know, we're, we're blessed, Al. We are truly blessed in many ways, especially professionally. And because of the platforms we've been given, I wanted to show, first of all, I know my personal journey. I know your journey. And, and it's nobody's business until you share it, which you have in a wonderful book. I'm, too many people have died. I could have been one of them. And even now, there are days, especially during this pandemic. And, yeah. and I'm an empath, Al. I see the suffering. I, I feel your pain at times. I feel people's pain. And for me, I need to make sure that I am I'm, I'm channeling it in the right way. So for me to, to show the, the, the naked truth, as it were, at times in the doc, it's only making it easier for everyone else to go, wait a minute, this guy called Mayweather McGregor mm-hmm. and he is dealing with this? Uh, thankfully, major celebrities, major athletes, Michael Phelps, the greatest Olympian ever, Kevin Love of the NBA, even LeBron James, uh, throughout the world now, the stigma is being smashed and shattered. Mm-hmm. And and this is, we need the best of the best, as it were, to show those kids and other adults who are suffering in silence and thinking about um, ending their lives because they feel shame. I can't talk to anybody about this. Um, uh, Brian Hawkins uh, at the uh, NFL Hall of Fame, Al, when he talked about his own battles, that's an alpha male football player, my friend. Yeah. So the more we open the discussion, the more we can discuss it openly. And for me, it's as simple as, hi, I'm Mauro Ranello. I live with bipolar disorder and uh, come on in. <laughs> like, it's not trying to, we have to normalize it. Yeah. You've been hit very hard by cancer. We all, I've been hit by cancer. Mental illness is, is the cancer, sir. It really is. Very well put. And if you had one message you wanted to give to an individual who is maybe suffering in silence with uh, what they perceive to be maybe uh, disorders that they're afraid to talk about, what's your message to them? The message is simply this. There is an incredible amount of support out there, including yours truly. And again, I say this uh, very, very honestly, Moro at MoroRinello.com. There are organizations like NAMI, NAMI NAMI.org. There are crisis lines. There are opportunities for you to just speak to someone who will not judge you, who will care about what you have to say and will simply listen. Uh, Therapy, talk therapy, I I encourage. Exercise, Al. Meditation. Really something we all as human beings need to do every day. And honestly, it's just keep up the good fight. There, There is always an answer. I am living proof. Hospitalized 12 times, Al. The first time I could have died, the doctor said. I'm here because I kept fighting. I'm here because of people like you and and people in my family and people who have supported me. 
and I want to support the world because that's the only way we're going to get through this. And I believe the pandemic has created a, an epidemic of mental illness issues, but I believe we're, we're coming together and that's the only way we are truly going to survive. So I just let everyone out there know if you're suffering in silence, I for one will listen. You and I have had eight years uh, together announcing boxing. I hope there are many more to come. Your career is, uh, uh, still has a long, long way to go with many, many achievements. And uh, Mara, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. Always an honor. Bless you, Al, and uh, really happy for your show. Uh, continued success. Thanks. So that was our chat with Mauro Ronaldo, uh, in which, uh, as you can see, he's a multifaceted man. Uh, we talked, he is willing to talk honestly about the issues he's uh, faced in life beyond sports. And, uh, and of course, when he talks about the art of broadcasting, Tripp, I, I find it really fascinating. Well, and it's interesting watching your fight that you had uh, now coming up on two weeks ago from Connecticut. You're separated from your broadcast partner physically. How difficult is that not to step on him and do, you know, normally you tap the guy in the shoulder. You and I've worked together a lot. It's easy. How do you do it now? Interesting you say, you say that because it's a big difference. Um, you know, we are, the way our configuration is now a lot of the broadcasting that's been done. I think we were the only, we're so far, we're the only broadcasting crew that has had all of the members on site. Uh, everyone else, ESPN, uh, Fox, uh, I think the zone as well. I'm not sure they've had, uh, people remote and they're remote from each other. So they're even more removed. They're not even physically near each other, but even being physically near each other, but removed by 20 feet, uh, was a real challenge. It was interesting. I, I was sitting on one end of the, the, uh, the side of the ring and he was on the other. I had Abner Mar or Naras next to me, but there was the timekeeper was in between us and I had to kind of lean over, you know, to look, uh, past her. Um, she probably thought I was flirting with her all night uh, <laughs> and, and to, to see Morrow's, you know, because you do have a lot of eye contact and you do have a lot of, and it was, it's a challenge. It was less of a challenge the second time because I had already done it once. And, um, but Marl and I especially rely on that kind of communication between each other. And we will often, like often I'll, if I want to make a comment early in a round, I'll just wave my finger or something or, or make some gesture to him. So it is a challenge to, uh, to be in that position. We got a lot better at it uh, the second time. And, uh, and I think as we continue, which we will be doing probably for the rest of the year, for sure, um, I think it'll, it'll continue to grow. And Al, which do you prefer, a two-man booth or a three-man booth? Well, I, to be really honest, I, even though I've worked in three-man booths for a long time now, and I'm in a three-man booth, I, I can't, as, what, as George Washington said, I cannot tell a lie. Uh, <laughs> if he really said that, I don't know. Uh, I... Uh, I like a two-man booth the best. Uh, I believe in all sports, two-man booths are more effective. Uh, I believe that in general, you can get the job done with two and that there's a chance for there to be more um, uh, space in between people talking so we don't have to hear somebody every second of every broadcast. And I just think in general, it's better. But it's a way of life now, three-man booths. And uh, not everyone, of course, now, baseball tends to have two-man boots. And part of that is just, you're probably not going to fly three guys around the country and pay for three guys to do all those baseball games. But a lot of other sports have leaned toward three-man uh, configurations. And, uh, you know, you, you, it, 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 you have to really work at making that work to make sure that, number one, you're not talking every second uh, and that everybody has a chance to make their points without it becoming too much. Sure. We, you and I worked a three-man booth one time unintended. We were doing a Friday night fight from Vegas, and David Brenner was sitting in the front row, and he kept coming up and bugging you and wanting to get in on the fight. I remember that. David kept coming by and kibitzing with us, even though we were on the air. David was a big <laughs> boxing fan. He has sadly passed away, but he was... Uh, he loved boxing. And right, that's right. He was popping over just to schmooze with us. You know, I, I guess he felt 
I wanted to say to him, David, let me ask you a question. If you were doing your stand-up, would you want me to come over there and, and schmooze with you while you're doing it? <laughs> he was a great guy. David was a brilliant man uh, who not only was, people know him as a great comedian, but in his earlier item, as a guest on my radio show many times, he was a brilliant filmmaker. He started his career as a documentary filmmaker and did that for a decade or more until he found his way into comedy. So yeah, you're right. We had a, we had a kibitzer that night. <laughs> um, well, I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, Mauro Ranallo, of course, uh, a fascinating guy. And uh, hopefully we, we answered all your questions and uh, gave you some good grist for the mill on this telecast. My thanks, of course, to, Lee, to uh, Trip, and my thanks to Lee for uh, producing this effort. And uh, we will see you next time. <laughs>